It is with great respect to the widows and families of the 26 men who were lost in both Scotiamon disasters that we write this story. May your families find peace and comfort as we remember your loved ones. This story is now dedicated to their memory. Long gone are the pickaxe, shovel, draft animals, and carbine lanterns that have always come to symbolize the coal miner. Automated mining equipment, modern battery-powered lights, and other safety equipment have made the grueling work much safer. However, mine disasters do happen. Cave-ins and gas pocket explosions are the worst fear while other accidents severely injure miners. One of the worst mine disasters in American history took place at the Scotia Mine in Letcher County, Kentucky. Twenty-six miners and federal mine inspectors would lose their lives in a twin explosion that would forever change the way that mining operations would happen from that moment forward. Blue Diamond Coal had its main office in Knoxville, Tennessee. It opened up a subsidiary named Scotia Mine in July of 1962. The mine opened in Oven Fork, Letcher County, Kentucky. This was northeast of the town of Cumberland, Harlan County, by 14 miles. The mine had nine slope entries into the Emboden coal bed. This coal bed had an average thickness of 72 inches in depth. On July 21, 1975, an automatic elevator was being constructed for the miners. This work had not been completed at the time of the explosions. The elevator shaft was being used as an air intake opening only at that time. There were two mine inspections that were held in 1976. The first was a federal mine inspection which was completed on February 27, 1976. On the evening shift of March 8, 1976, a federal coal mine inspector conducted a health and safety technical inspection. Just a few hours later, on the morning of March 9, 1976, at 7 a.m., the day shift of 106 men entered the mine and was transported by battery-powered portal buses and locomotives to go to work. At 11.45 a.m. that morning, an explosion from a pocket of methane gas and coal dust rocketed the Scotia mine, killing 15 miners. All 13 men who were working in the two southeast main area and the two men who were working in the left section off the two southeast main area died as a direct result of the explosion. 91 men that were working in other parts of the mine made their way to the surface of the mine without mishap. MESA investigators believe that this explosion happened because of a poor ventilation and an electrical spark from a battery-powered locomotive or other electrical device. The first explosion originated near the number 31 crosscut of the two southeast main area. It is believed that the forces of the explosion expanded to all five of the number two southeast main entries, extended into two left section off of two southeast main, and lost its forces by the time it reached a northeast main junction. The bodies of the men were removed from the mine and inspections began. It was important for all concerned to find out exactly how the mine exploded and if anyone was at blame. On March 11, 1976, at 11.30 p.m., just two days later, after the recovery of 15 men had been completed, 13 miners also went down to the entrance of the number 2 Southeast Main to work. A second explosion happened that killed 11 rescue miners and federal mine inspectors. There were two repairmen that were a short distance out from the entrance and escaped injury. MESA investigators also believe that poor ventilation had also been a factor in this explosion. It is believed that the second explosion originated near the entrance of the two left section off the two southeast main. It is believed that a methane air mixture was ignited by one of the five possible sources. It was either a, an electrical arc or a spark from a battery equipped deluge system, scoop batteries, three battery-equipped telephones, residue fires, or a frictional spark from a fall of a mine roof 
on a roof bolting machine. The second explosion went through the two left section, all five of the two southeast main sections, and stopped near the two southeast main junction in the northern direction. The explosion had also stopped at the southeast main junction in the southern direction. After the second explosion, the mine was sealed to let the gases inside settle and stabilize. Rescue teams began on July 14, 1976 to reestablish ventilation in the mine, repair the entrances, and drain the water accumulating in the mine. Inch by inch, they made their way to the men that were victims to the second explosion. Over the summer months, a group of 20 widows of the miners picketed the mine to protest the slow-moving actions to recover their husbands. The picket line was often breached by miners in trucks and automobiles. They would hurl insults and obscenities at the widows for picketing. It is thought that behind the actions of some of these picket line breakers is that they felt that the mine should have never closed because it was hurting their incomes. Re-entry was permitted on November the 19th, 1976, 253 days after the Scotia mine disaster. The 11 men were finally brought to the surface. There were heated words spoken and many tears from the families as the men were laid upon the three mine rail cars in zippered plastic bags. The bodies were taken to pathologists to determine the cause of the deaths. Six widows had their husbands autopsied. This was to determine if they had black lung disease. The bodies were then given to the families for burial. Representative Carl D. Perkins gave a speech just down the hill from where the bodies were being brought out. In his speech, he laid the blame upon the Federal Mining Enforcement and Safety Administration for the bad judgment and laxity of the enforcement of the laws on the books. There is debate over if the men should have returned to the mine sooner to recover the bodies. One side commends the actions of the rescuers to take their time for the sake of safety of the men to prevent more loss of life. The other side feels that longer action was taken so that reestablishing production of the mine could resume faster. Federal Mine Safety and Health Act of 1977 was passed as a direct result of this mine disaster. The Act of 1969 was strengthened in its new Act. The Mine Safety and Health Administration was moved from the Department of the Interior to the Department of Labor. Shortly after the twin mining disasters, civil and criminal cases began to be fought over in the court system. Both civil and criminal charges began in 1977 with the widows suing because of the deaths of their husbands. In 1977, the widows of the men who were killed in both mining disasters sued Blue Diamond Coal Company of Knoxville, Tennessee. The suit was for $60 million from the 15 widows for negligence against Blue Diamond. The suit is named Boggs versus Blue Diamond Coal. The United States District Court Judge Howard David Hermansdorfer for the Eastern District of Kentucky ruled under the Kentucky Workmen's Compensation Act the coal company was exempt from tort liability. The case was dismissed. The Kentucky Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit held that under the Kentucky's Workmen's Compensation Act that Blue Diamond Coal Company as a parent company was not immune from tort liability because of its own independent acts of negligence in the matter. They sent the matter back to Judge Hermansdorfer, who stepped aside from the case. The press and public pressed Judge Hermansdorfer because of conflicts of interest. He owned investments in several coal mining companies. While he still presided over the criminal case, the civil case was brought by the widows was then reassigned to Judge William Bertelsman. The case was finally settled in 1980 when Blue Diamond Coal Company agreed to pay the widows $5.5 million. On April 13, 1978, the Blue Diamond Coal Company filed civil suit against the U.S. Department of Interior. 
This suit is asking for $9,327,160 in damages resulting from the second explosion on March the 11th. The suit contends that the Interior and Mine Enforcement and Safety Administration employees were negligent in their acts and omissions and caused the second explosion that killed eight miners and three federal inspectors. Three years after the explosion, Patrick Malloy of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Kentucky brought criminal charges against both mining companies and was among the last of the suits to be brought. The United States versus Blue Diamond and Scotia, the federal prosecutors brought charges of failing to make regular checks for methane, falsifying ventilation maps, improper training of the miners and safety equipment, and other charges. Three years later, which was six years after the death of the 26 men, Scotia pleaded guilty to two criminal charges in the case. In the courtroom of Federal Judge G. Wicks and Thank, both companies also pleaded no contest to three of the charges. In turn, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Kentucky agreed to drop all other charges and recommended a fine of $80,000. The amount was the maximum that it was allowed at the time for the safety laws. The U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Kentucky recommended that Judge Unthunk order Scotia Mining to either pay the fine or contribute $60,000 to charitable organizations that had given relief to the disaster. The Eastern District's Probation Office provided the judge with a list of nonprofit organizations that the judge could choose from. This marked the end of the criminal trials and penalties against Scotia. Within two years, all parties involved had settled among themselves and with the miners' families. There were legal papers filed on behalf of the widows of the lost miners of the second explosion in federal court in Pikeville, Kentucky. In January of 1981, the first arguments were heard on whether the federal government could legally be responsible for the second explosion at the Scotia Coal Company mine. The reason being is that it had just passed two federal inspections, one of which was just hours before the first explosion. The widows claimed that the federal government was negligent in their duties to protect the miners and this led to their deaths. Attorney Gerald Stern of Washington, D.C. argued that the men were relying on the Federal Mining Enforcement and Safety Administration, or the MESA, to act on their behalf if the miners were not safe. The mine was unsafe and MESA allowed them to continue working. The U.S. Department of Justice saw the dismissal of the case. The basis for their argument was that the men knew that there had been a previous explosion just days before and that the ventilation controls had been destroyed. Two insurance companies filed a $1.6 million lawsuit against the Interior's Department, MESA. The two insurance companies held coverage plans on Scotia Mine at the time of the two explosions. The suit was filed in the Pikeville's U.S. District Court. The charges alleged that MESA's negligence was the cause of both explosions on March 9th and 11th. Both of these cases were also settled. In memory of those who have lost their lives, Glenn Barker, Dennis Boggs, Everett Scott Combs, Virgil Coots, Don Creech, Larry David McKnight, Earl Galloway, David Gibbs, Robert Griffin, John Hackworth, J. B. Holbrook, Kenneth B. Kaiser, Roy McKnight, Lawrence Peavy, Carl Polly, Richard M. Sammons, Tommy Ray Scott, Ivan Gale Sparkman, James Sturgill, Jimmy W. Sturgill, Monroe Sturgill, Kenneth Turner, Willie D. Turner, Grover Tussie, Denver Wildner, and James Williams. To each of you, may you rest in peace. Thank you for continuing to read and watch Kentucky Tennessee Living Post. We deeply appreciate it. 
Our goal has always been to bring the history back to the Appalachian Mountains. Please like, subscribe, and share below. Also hit the bell for notification of future videos. And once again, be sure to leave us a hey y'all in the comment section below. Thank you for continuing to support us and watch our videos.